Hi everyone, it's great to join you at the DAS conference today. In my role as Chief Commercial Officer with Tay Park, I have the pleasure of working with customers across a really diverse range of industries and they include government, financial services, media and entertainment, life sciences, and at a high level, we see that the data custodians in these organizations face some really common uh, and similar problems. So today I thought I'd share with you some of those challenges outside of media and entertainment because we all know it's really difficult to get to some of those conferences to see what other people are doing, let alone your own industry events. Um, and to set the scene, um, Seagate Powered by Tay Park is a partnership between Seagate and Tay Park and we focus on the mass migration of tape to cloud. Um, we provide this service out of our Oklahoma, Amsterdam and Australian facilities, hence the accent. So I mentioned some of the similarities and if I looked at our customers, they would typically be um, organizations that work in data or content centric um, organizations. They find it really difficult to implement their retention policies and in lieu of a really good retention policy, they'll just keep and archive everything. Um, and, and of course that becomes problematic. Most of the data that they've stored is currently offline. It's sitting on backup tapes and often they've used uh, generations um, of backup tape that change every uh, two to five years. So they're managing a really diverse range of media as well. And they know that that data that's sitting offline has a huge amount of potential through the application of AI and ML. And they are of course now working from home. So um, these data custodians are trying to serve their stakeholders, but they're working with infrastructure that was really designed to have a lot of interaction. And so their content is sitting um, offline, they're finding it difficult to access, and, th and that's where we come in, of course. In the media and entertainment sector, our use case is fairly well known. We take uh, customers who, who may be broadcasters, movie studios, or museums, and we take their content, we extract it from tape, whichever generation it is, and then we mass migrate that to cloud storage. And once it's there, um, our customers will apply AI and ML and they'll extract things like celebrity identification, speech to text transcription, and all in all, they find that the data is much more enhanced and can be used for a range of different purposes. Um, most predominantly audience engagement. And I think we're gonna hear a little bit more about that in the um, presentations coming up. But outside of uh, media and entertainment, one of the areas I was going to talk about, and this is possibly not the most popular industry, is the energy sector. So in the energy sector, when they, um, and, and there is a twist to this one, so hang in there even if you're not a fan of the sector. Um, so this is an exploration vessel. Typically an oil and gas company would send this out. Um, it tows a bunch of sensors that you can see off the back of the vessel and it would go out for months at a time. When it goes out for months at a time, those sensors are picking up a picture of the subsurface uh, geology of what's below the seafloor. And ideally they're looking for the rock structures that would be ideal for um, hydrocarbon discovery. When they're doing that, they're collecting a huge amount of data and it can be multiple petabytes. And if you think of a film process, you could think of this being the raw camera footage and eventually they're gonna whittle it down to the finished movie. Um, multiple copies might be made and sent to stakeholders, that's joint venture partners, government regulators, and processing houses who are going to provide some value add on that data as well. Of course, when they create each copy, they're sending a copy to, a, to an offsite warehouse where it stays, and that replicates as they get closer and closer to their finished product. If the oil company ever wants to receive this data, because there's so much of it, they'll bring back pieces of it at a time to their organization for interpretation. And this has been the workflow that's occurred for decades. In a survey like this, you could have an organization generating two and a half thousand tapes. And even if they don't update the tapes throughout the project lifecycle, if you just looked at the cost of the tape 
and the tape storage over um, a project life cycle, you could be looking at around a million dollars. And that, that media is cost is relatively low when you consider the, the exploration cost or the cost of the data on there maybe well into the tens of millions of dollars. And ultimately, um, historically, the data has remained out of reach because it's sitting on tape. Now with the advent of machine learning, um, a lot of these organizations are looking to bring their data from tape to the cloud. And when they do that, they're taking advantage of data tiering, specifically the archive tiers of cloud storage that are available today. They're enjoying the benefit of increased redundancy of that um, storage because they can store it in multiple locations instead of just one, uh, one or two copies of tape. The interoperability of that data increases significantly. Rather than creating an entirely new copy of tapes, they can now simply right click and share um, that information with their stakeholders. It also works wonderfully for remote access. So now that they're working at home, those organizations who've been through this process can simply uh, share their data with their stakeholders and that may be some geophysicists who are doing interpretation work on that. Um, they also have the benefit of not having to update their tape types ever again. Um, part of cloud storage means that the um, the storage medium is taken care of. So it's essentially evergreened and they no longer have to worry about uh, format obsolescence. And of course, machine learning that is available today was not available back in the 1970s and 80s when some of this data was collected. And so what they're finding is uh, the geophysicists who originally interpreted the data may not have had time or the resources to analyze everything. So machine learning can pass over a vast amount of data very quickly and efficiently. So where the twist is, and I mentioned there would be a twist, is that as these energy companies um, progress, they are making genuine steps towards looking at uh, alternative energy sources. It's definitely not going to be an overnight flick of the switch uh, kind of shift in their business model. However, they are looking at areas that they can get involved in. And one of those areas is helping to clean up the carbon from the atmosphere. So they can use machine learning to identify geology that's ideal for carbon sequestration. That's the idea of taking excess carbon or polluting carbon and putting it down into rock formations. So the original um, use of that data and when it was captured, they're, they're looking at applying almost the opposite use case for that. And they couldn't have predicted that when the, uh, when the data was uh, first captured. Another area that we're finding is quite interesting for data being retained and then being reused is in the engineering sector. Around the world at the moment, governments are looking to stimulate their economies um, following the initial parts of the pandemic through a lot of infrastructure and rebuilding. And if you looked at roads, rail and bridges, typically they have a data retention policy that is the life of the asset plus a number of years. And that may be a 50 year bridge or a 100 year bridge. So you need to keep all of the information for that period. The stakeholders involved and those who want to access that data can be governments, insurance companies, and even other engineering companies who want to access the original plans for additional work. And of course, the information that was collected and is being stored for those assets uh, is largely offline. Drawings, notes, there was some then moved into emails and digital drawings and CAD drawings. So most of that information is sitting offline today. However, we've seen that there's, um, and, and of course it's not, not always backed up well, it's difficult to access. Um, and we've seen that the opportunities in this industry really lie from bringing that data online and applying today's AI and ML tools. And so what they can do is look at um, a vast number of CAD drawings using, using machine learning and identify similar features. For example, if a bridge type was used again and again, they know a particular weld on that bridge or types of welds are susceptible to corrosion. They can then target preventative maintenance. And if they're looking to do this part as, as part of a stimulus spend, 
they can really efficiently deploy that capital to make sure that they have less infrastructure downtime. So it's really about positioning the data so it's usable today. So some key takeaways when we look across our, our customer industries are that archiving data is a universal challenge. We're looking, we're seeing that organizations are moving to evergreen storage so they don't have those tape obsolescence issues. We've seen two major inflection points. That's been the cost of cloud storage and the advent of dedicated archive cloud tiers. And of course, the pandemic and businesses needing to uh, design their workflows to be a lot more resilient and allow people to work from home. And of course, all of our customers are looking to position their legacy historical information to make it accessible to today's AI and ML tools and realize a lot of additional value. It's been an absolute pleasure to join you today for DAS and, and of course, we'd love to answer any questions that you have. Thanks so much for your time.